the magic of uh, magic of it all. There it is. Okay. Welcome everybody. We'll be starting just a couple minutes. Just let uh, everybody get a chance to uh, to come in and get uh, get settled in front of their computers. <laughs> All right, well, let's get going here. Um, good evening uh, and welcome to Wither Criticism, a discussion about architectural criticism. This six episode series is sponsored by the Wilsonian Public Humanities Lab and funded by the Office of the Provost at Florida International University. I'm Dan Evans, a faculty member of the Department of Journalism and Media and the Miami Bureau Chief for the South Florida Media Network. And I'm David Rifkind, a faculty member in the Department of Architecture. We've asked six current and former architecture critics to discuss the current state of the field and to offer their thoughts on how architecture criticism needs to adjust to respond to the major crises of our time. Tonight, we're pleased to welcome Mimi Zeiger. Ms. Zeiger is a Los Angeles-based critic, educator, and curator. She was co-curator of the U.S. Pavilion for the 2018 Venice Architecture Biennale, and currently curating the 2020 to 2021 exhibit Columbus in Columbus, Indiana. Welcome, Mimi. Thank you for having me. Really great to be here. Um, so let me just uh, first off say thank you uh, to David and Dan for inviting me to be part of this event. The topic is very close to my heart of uh, architecture and criticism. Um, and then I also just wanted to add that um, I come out of sort of the fields of architecture, but I also sort of have affinities to punk and to zine making, which is how I got my start in criticism. And um, with that, I wanted to also say that like the thoughts that I'm gonna be sharing tonight are drawing on my own experiences, but they're also sort of based uh, a lot on collaborations and conversations that I've had with friends and colleagues um, over the years. And so I just want to give a shout out to all of those folks who, because I think the ideas of criticism being collective, and I'll talk about this in a little bit, um, are super important to the way that uh, things are shaping up today. So bear with me for a second why I share my screen so that this, uh, make sure that this all works. Okay, everyone see that all right? Um, so without further ado, um, let's start with a sentence uh, from Joan Didion. Uh, we tell ourselves stories in order to live. This is one of the most famous overquoted lines from Joan Didion's The White Album, which is an anxiety filled collection of essays that captures in really sharp crystalline prose a period of time not, like un not unlike our own, which is filled with uncertainty, violence, and social change. And Didion's quote is almost always used as a kind of a balm, uh, a kind of reassurance that our stories will prevail. But the rest of Didion's opening paragraph tends to be overlooked. She starts with, we tell ourselves stories in order to live and then continues with a kind of more complex and darker prose. We look for the sermon in the suicide, for the social or moral lesson in the murder of five. We interpret what we see, select the most workable of the multiple choices. We live entirely, especially if we're writers, by the imposition of a narrative line upon disparate images, by the quote ideas with which we have learned to freeze the shifting phantasmagoria, which is our actual experience. This fever dream of Didion's actual experience of the mid 1960s to the early 1970s is a time of cultural upheaval and it has unsettling parallels to our own movement, um, our own moment, uh, one that 
futurist artist and designer Olekian Jafeus, um, whose work we show here uh, with his uh, Crown Heights Bodega Eco Haven, a kind of eco futurist, Afro futurist idea of what a post, um, post mobility, uh, post power uh, New York City might look like. But he calls it a pandem illusion, a portmanteau of pandemic and revolution. Didion wrote about the Watts riots, about a celebrity governor, anti-war protests, fights for civil rights, the Manson murders, and the death of Jim Morrison. And finding and articulating this narrative of a, of a country, of a culture in flux. I read Didion's quote alongside one from architecture critic Ada Louise Huxtable, taken from her 1969 review of Robert Venturi's Complexity and Contradiction, which was published in the New York Times under the title, The Case for Chaos. Writes Huxtable, today's theory is tomorrow's practice. With the speed up characteristic of our age, it has a way of becoming today's practice. Any thinking, feeling citizen involved with his environment in this later part of the 20th century that's right, later, with all the projections to one awesome remote year of 2000, no more than a comfortable middle age for the present generation. But we must know the wave of the future uh, or succumb to the undertow of the past. And in a way, I'm looking at the past to sort of predict the future today. But Huxtable's word speed up intrigues me it reminds me of our own accelerationist anxieties. Today, our news cycle conflates presidential bromides, COVID coverage, Kanye meltdowns into digestible feeds, and architectural criticism exists within this flow, competing with and subject to the churn. And it's aiming for the future while trying to kick free of the undertow, the pull of the past, of what nostalgic ideas we may have had for criticism. So as we're convened here to think about the state of architectural criticism today and how criticism must change to respond to the major crises of our time, we need to consider just what are, as Didion said, the ideas which, which we have learned to freeze, the shifting phantasmagoria, which is our actual existence. I say that because isn't the framing of ideas, especially in really complex times like our own, at the very heart of criticism? Criticism is not a fast or hot take. It's not a Pete Wells takedown. It's not clickbait. It's not a passing of judgment from on high or an exercise in arbiting taste or its aesthetics. Architectural criticism by which I mean the critique of buildings, master plans, landscapes, books, exhibitions, biennials, and design culture on the whole, identifies important narratives, gives them context, questions received histories, and deepens and transmits meaning. Uh, and yet critique is not limited to the space of the essay I've written about and defended the ways that social media, such as Instagram, Twitter, and meme culture, contribute to something that I call collective criticism, one that is dependent on multiple authors and multiple perspectives. And what I'm showing here is a project that I did with SVA's Decrit Summer Intensive in 2012 with designer Neil Donnelly, where we asked a group of 20 students, emerging writers, uh, to tweet their way around Manhattan and Brooklyn for the course of two weeks. And then we created a, um, a book out of a kind of a, a book of pamphlets, which could also be hung in the, in the street um, of these sort of handbills uh, of their tweets and sort of suggesting that together uh, all of this becomes part of discourse. Um, so I'm, I'm not an architecture critic because I hate architecture and want to take a swing at every star architect, um, even though they can be really puffed up with their own self-worth. Um, 
I'm a critic because against all odds, I love architecture. I, I, it's hard to believe, but I do. I'm a bit of an architecture nerd uh, at every turn. I, I'm trained in architecture. Um, I see that criticism happens at the scale of the facade detail in the analysis of entrance circulation and how policy changes might impact the urban fabric. I'm deeply invested in how architecture shapes and is shaped by culture. Um, and here we have a piece of by Curé architecture by Francis Curé, whose work I read about in Art Forum last year, uh, and his Serpentine Pavilion from 2017. Uh, and his work is about sort of translating cultures from place to place. And so I'm really interested in how the built environment is designed and where architecture provides aesthetic value. It also brings people together, like here in the Serpentine. Um, and, also, um, and also where it fails to account for equity. Um, so this is a slide from, uh, of uh, the work of Norwegian artist and architect um, Jor Nongo. He's of the Sami people which is the indigenous peoples of Norway. Uh, and what we're looking at is a collection of architecture based on the Lavu, which is a Sami meeting place. And he has done a lot of research and tracking and created uh, artworks around the way that Norwegian architects or Western European architects have basically taken an indigenous form and then sort of repurposed it to the point where, as he said, um, when I interviewed him for Pinup Magazine earlier this year, that, um, that it becomes almost Venturi-esque, that it becomes a little bit like um, the duck, uh, right? So it, it sort of loses one meeting and becomes a stand-in or something else. Uh, so with that, I say that uh, I think this work is super interesting um, and it also sort of reveals questions of power, of get, who gets to write the narratives. And I'm very interested and in fact suspicious of different forms of power within the field. Um, the entrenched hierarchies uh, that, that are there, the gendered and racial biases, and the flows of capital and investment, of course. But I still believe that architecture is a powerful imaginary, especially in times like ours where, you know, where you're sort of hard to even imagine what the future looks like. Um, architecture is an act of speculation and it asks us to envision something before it happens. Uh, I teach at SciArc um, here in Los Angeles, and recently I assigned an essay about the tension between freedom and utopia uh, to my class. Uh, the class is called Other Futures. Um, and the essay by Ursula K. Le Guin, uh, she writes, we will not know our own injustice if we cannot imagine justice. We will not be free if we do not imagine freedom. And we cannot demand that anyone try to attain justice and freedom who has not had a chance to imagine what is attainable. And, and she's writing this in the context of thinking about utopias. And so what kind of you know, architectural utopia might we find? And, and I think it's something to, to sort of think about and to, even, even when we're sort of, wrecking, sort of working through the complexities of our time, what, you know, what is, what is that sort of process? What is that journey? Um, this is a slide from the U.S. Pavilion that I co-curated with Anne Louis, Neil Atkinson, and Iker Gill for the 2018 Venice uh, Architecture Biennale uh, titled um, Dimensions of Citizenship. And we're looking at a work uh, by Amanda Williams, Andres Hernandez, in collaboration with Shawnee Crow called Thrival Geographies, in my mind, a sea a line. And this piece is about what, you know, it asks, what is an architecture of black citizenship? Um, a group of people who have been, whose, where citizenship has been withheld from them in many different ways. Um, and then how does one then make an architectural gesture of liberation? Uh, that is both liberatory and sort of, and sort of, and protective. And so uh, the work is this metal sort of railroad taking inspiration from Harriet Tubman. Uh, and then also this sort of enclosure taking inspiration from another uh, escaped slave who hid in the rafters 
of a house, um, Harriet, um, oh, uh, forgetting her name right now, but it'll come back to me. Um, and the whole thing is sort of covered in braided cord, uh, sort of which references the, the language of braided hair. So I think of this as, as like a super speculative project, right? What is an architecture of black liberation or black citizenship? Um, and so in order to imagine what uh, Afrofuturist writer Samuel L. Delaney calls the necessity of tomorrow, right? We have to think of what's next. Um, we as critics uh, have to check our own privileges. Um, the most important question we should be asking right now as critics is whose narratives are being told uh, and whose voices have platforms. There's a real reckoning going on right now within architecture regarding the scarcity of black, brown, and indigenous stories. A correction has been taking place over the last few months with the celebration and publication of designers of color. And this is both uh, welcome and necessary, but also it's only partial. The issues within the field are quite structural. Architecture, um, the field and the discipline likes to see itself as a meritocracy. The rituals of architectural training of which I've been through uh, celebrate peer to peer competition and hard work. And the profession demands like super long hours and really short deadlines. The 18th century occult de Beaux Arts tradition of the charrette, where you basically spend, you know, a very short amount of time working really hard and then you bring your work to be judged. Um, it gives historical license to a mode of working uh, that privileges the young, the able-bodied, uh, and those who are available or who can afford to be available. And as old-fashioned as it seems, there's still a lingering belief that this crucible filters out the weak need or the weak-minded, letting only the strongest designs prevail. Designers uh, will then rise to the top. But this method, uh, which is still upheld in experimental and corporate offices alike, uh, whether we like it or not, um, it really fails to level the playing field for many uh, at the intersection of race, gender, ability, and class, so that a career in architecture is really the most dynamic for those who can afford it, um, from top schools and unpaid internships to setting up one's own practice and cultivating clients. Just a sec. So Kenneth Jones and Tima Akun identify several characteristics of white supremacy culture. And among them are ones that are very sort of close to architecture, ideas of perfectionism, a sense of urgency, individuality, and paternalism. All of these are embedded in architecture culture. And while the field is undergoing a much needed self-reflection, these conditions are quite deep rooted. And as architecture critics, we have to recognize ourselves as complicit in upholding narratives of singular genius over plural authorship and seeing design as a kind of feel good solution uh, rather than architecture as a resulting artifact of capital investment and policy. In 2018, which was the anniversary um, of Whit uh, civil rights leader uh, Whitney Young's speech to the AIA um, in which he pretty much laid out uh, all of the things that were sort of wrong with architecture at the time and many of which um, are still with us. Um, questions of uh, both the, that the field is very white, uh, that it promotes housing um, and segregation, uh, and that there is less, there isn't access and equity within it. Um, and then challenged architects to maybe take this up as a stance. Um, in, that year, in 2018, I put together a package with Architect Magazine interviewing um, a dozen or so black architects and thinkers in the field to sort of reflect on a young speech. Um, and what we found was that we're still there. And it was, you know, both uh, really 
amazing to be able to speak to all these great designers, but also um, really kind of like hits at the heart about sort of where uh, where the field is for a certain percentage of the population. In fact, uh, Jennifer, as she writes in her from Dream the Combine, um, and who I'm including in Exhibit Columbus coming up, she says that she's the 277th Black female licensed in the United States. Right? Like there is a way that you know you keep count because we haven't hit the number of digits in which counting doesn't matter anymore. Um, so. Over the last few years, um, there have been groups such as the Architecture Lobby uh, and Who Builds Your Architecture, um, which have organized to shine light on labor practices within the profession and within the building construction uh, industry. And I've written about both groups and I annually invite the Architecture Lobby to come speak into uh, my classes about the need of organizing and the structural implications of disrupting the gatekeeping of what is generally a uh, gentleman's profession. Um, and then in light of the uh, upheavals in Black Lives Matter this summer, there are several different projects have started, uh, design as protest, office hours, and the dark university are using techniques modeled on collective action and mutual aid to not only raise uh, attention or awareness about structural racism, but also question the very tools and skill sets required to move through a very white profession. Um, such groups resonate with Audre Lorde's off-quoted architectural dictum that you cannot use the master's tools to tear down the master's house. Uh, increasingly as well, uh, I've been looking to intersectional feminism to provide an underpinning to my work. And I've written extensively about gender equity, uh, inequity in architecture and the ways that bias and abuse went unchecked and rarely reported until the Me Too movement forced it out into the opening, into the open. Uh, but I've also been writing about where femi feminism sits within architecture. and. Um, one of the stories I did for Metropolis last year was uh, included uh, the Women's School of Planning and Architecture from 1975, which was a group that set out to sort of find ways of making that were um, inherent to, to women. Um, and so they actually sort of put together like a whole series of workshops and sort of kept it going as a way of trying to sort of begin to bring women into the profession and teach them uh, the skills that they need. Um, I, I also should say that I make it a point to write about artists, architects, and designers who are uh, uh, unrepresented or underrepresented. Um, but this means not only focusing or profiling their work in a feature um, or a critique, but it also means an including uh, a diversity of voices when I'm looking for supporting materials. Um, for quotes and for examples across all of my research and reporting. Uh, this is a slide of uh, Leong Long and KFA Architects um, Los Angeles LGBT Center, the Anita May campus, which opened last year um, and which I was writing about through the lens of queer theory and thinking about it as um, a possible future, like towards towards a queer architecture, um, and uh, you know, sort of really got to sort of think about sort of what does it mean in terms of visibility uh, for the LGBTQ community in Los Angeles to now have sort of a building of high caliber architecture and sort of where the architecture serves it and where it doesn't. So. My way of working over the last few years as I've been kind of doing these kinds of articles of looking at these themes um, has changed. Um, I've been influenced by the work of scholar and critic Jane Rendell, who in writing about feminist and critical spatial practices argues for a criticism that is both objective and subjective, distant and, and uh, intimate. Um, in addition to the known act of observing or what we might call reporting, um, she's looking for spaces that can be dreamed, remembered, and imagined. And she wants to 
challenge criticism as a form of knowledge with a singular and static point of view located in the here and now. And, and I think the way that tonight we're sort of looking backwards and forwards simultaneously, I think is, is in, indicative of that uh, way of practice. Um, architect Michael Sorkin, uh, my architect and critic Michael Sorkin passed away uh, from the coronavirus um, early in the pandemic. And um, the loss of his fearless critical voice um, and his unrelenting defense of the public realm on behalf of its residents um, is really heartbreaking. Uh, so many you know, months later, um, streets, sidewalks, parks, and infrastructure in his mind, and, and I'd like to echo it, um, are just as important, if not uh, more important, than individual buildings. And I think, and I can imagine the piece that he would have written about taking the taking down of Jim Crow monuments, uh, the reclaiming of streetscapes with the words in giant capital letters, Black Lives Matter, um, as well as the protests going on around the country, actually, and around the world. Um, I've taught criticism in many places from Las Vegas to Hong Kong here in New York uh, is a uh, uh, one another piece, another year of the SVA summer intensive where we did a debate standing in front of the Trump Hotel on 57th Street as we were uh, debating the uh, skinny high rise towers along 57th that had cropped up seemingly overnight and sort of what um, you know, sort of what kind of uh, future they and what they sort of suggest and each of these uh, emerging writers were asked to uh, take a stance and debate it in public on an apple box <laughs> they did great um, so every time i teach one of these workshops i assign sorkin's essay advice to critics um, which was written in a period marked by anti-Iraq uh, war protests. Um, the text is broken up into about a dozen points, um, beginning with the Evergreen Command, um, which, which is like, if, we, if, we, if you take away anything, take away Sorkin's advice tonight, which is always visit the building. Um, but it also includes uh, sections on who profits and it's the city, stupid. Uh, his text is a field guide. Um, it's crystal clear in its positionality, and it's a lesson to those who might get caught up in seeing design um, as a philosophy or design as a style. He doesn't uh, go for any of that. Um, and it's around the same time that he opens another essay, Architecture and the Avant-Garde, with the sentence, all architecture is political. So if you're with me so far, uh, I'm going to assume that this is a no-brainer statement coming from me. Um, it's pretty obvious at this point. It's important and necessary, but not everyone in the field abides by this statement. Folks like uh, Patrick uh, Schumacher of Zaha Hadid Architects, perhaps vis-a-vis uh, -vis Manuel Tafuri, argue that architecture is autonomous from the vicissitudes of the political sphere precisely because it's not an arena that architecture with a capital A can have a real impact. Um, so how one sees architecture's agency as entwined with politics really depends on how one defines architecture and the extents of its influence. Um, and I, I like Sorkin's uh, suggestion that all architecture is political because he then continues to describe it that by marshalling and distributing resources, organizing social space and orchestrating encounters, architecture is the medium through which human relations are given dimension. I think that's a really beautiful sort of way of sort of summing up how we move and interact with architecture and actually sort of why architecture matters, um, that it's not just an expression uh, of form um, or authorship. Sorkin is telling us that architecture is not abstract. It isn't something other. Uh, it isn't apart from us. Um, it's a way, if not the only way, that we relate to the world. But if architecture is political, we have to consider the role of the architecture critic. And I often think about the possible ways we could view the critic's role. 
as an activist, uh, as an advocate, as an ally. Historically, the role of the critic as activist um, has been reserved for questions of preservation. Uh, Italy's Huxtable fought to save New York City's Penn Station by McKim, Mead and White, and Los Angeles-based critic Esther McCoy fiercely campaigned in the 1960s to save Irving Gill's Dodge House and was one of the founders of the Citizens Committee to Save the Dodge House, which was built in 1916 and the residents, which had super clean lines, undecorated arches and reinforced concrete construction, was considered one of the first truly modern designs on the West Coast. So I'm reminded by a quote by Esther McCoy about the Dodge House, which still resonates. We prize the distant past, but if the, the immediate past is ripped away, there will be no distant past for the future. Our heritage is diminished and there is a hole in the fabric of history. And alas, both the buildings became holes. Penn Station was demolished in 63. The Dodge House was uh, demolished in 1970 um, after the city of LA basically deemed it unworthy of preservation. Um, but while these both structures were lost, the actions on behalf of these two critics created very real change in the perception of the built environment and established ongoing policy. For instance, Huxtable's efforts led to New York City's passing the Landmarks Law in 1965, which established the Landmarks Preservation Commission. And similarly, McCoy's work highlighted the need for preservation efforts in Los Angeles, um, which would later be formalized with the founding of the LA Conservancy in 1978 around the possible demolition of the um, LA Central Library. This spring and summer, LACMA demolished what was left of William Pereira's campus to make way for the controversial design by Swiss architect Peter Zumthor. Um, many art and architecture critics, including Greg Golden, Joseph Giovannini, Carolina Miranda, Christopher Knight, who got a Pulitzer for his work on this, uh, and myself have made cases to preserve the old building, which is, no, which is now moot, um, but also critiqued the new design on everything from lack of a master plan, reduced exhibition space, and questionable finances. Right now there's a hole. I wrote about this hole uh, earlier this year. Um, and what it means for the citizens of Los Angeles to have a hole where the art museum used to be in the middle of a pandemic. Um, it's really unclear how the museum and county will muster together the full $750 million needed for construction. Um, but at the same time, there's a, a campaign uh, to sort of sell this building to the public. And there was just a New Yorker article um, written uh, about Peter Zimfor, pro profiling him as a omakase chef, um, right? That he, he needed to like kind of be the most, del you know, required the most delicate hand. Um, when really uh, a place like Los Angeles, and this is like tweeted recently, it's like needs a Roy Choi. It needs someone who's fusion on the streets, kind of the food, who's gonna be the food truck of architecture. That's, that's what Los Angeles probably needs. But these ample writings around LACMA, for the most part, they illustrate the role of a critic as an advocate. Um, one um, that is illuminating these key issues in the built environment and bringing them to a larger public. Um, what's at stake here is often discourse, really. Um, it's not direct action. Um, and this is not a bad thing, actually. I, th I think this is actually a kind of sweet spot for criticism. A uh, territory uh, that I've felt that I've worked in a lot. I've gotten a lot of traction on topics around obsolescence and labor to women in architecture and urbanism after police violence. Um, so, so I think that this is sort of a rich area and one that we tend to wade into. Um, but it's allyship that's been on my mind since May and the deaths of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor by the hands of police officers. I wonder how can an architect be an ally, or a critic be an ally? I really struggle with this question. Um, even though I've been thinking about it since around 2014 and the shooting of Michael Brown in Ferguson, 
At that time, I spoke with uh, architect and current Princeton professor Mitch McEwen uh, with the intent of using my platform to amplify what she had to say on the topic. Um, and in discussing the ways that architects can contribute to the fight against injustices against people of color, including police violence, I quoted her as saying, architects and urban designers can take the Black Lives Matter campaign as an opportunity to look deeply into the ways that the tools of the discipline have been defined through attempts to erase Black people from the American city. I don't mean in conjunction with, but actually the tools of the discipline emerging through the very acts of controlling, erasing, and displacing Black bodies. And this echoes back to Whitney Young's uh, 68 speech. In our back and forth, uh, McEwen made a comparison to climate change that designers need to give as much attention to race as they do to climate change and sustainability. Um, and, and while consciousness has been raised on both topics, you know, we're really only just beginning to realize in the ways that these issues are so interlocked. They're both stemming from anthropocentric uh, and colonial entitlements from questions of gentrification and power and extraction. Six years later, uh, this is the crux of an ongoing, nowhere near resolved conversation. And when I look back on my notes from this 2014 article, one of the things that I see that I missed in the, in, is that there's an infrastructural capacity needed to raise awareness. Um, that my voice and my platform, um, even when coupled together with Mitch's, was not going to be heard unless the field and society at large was ready to hear them. And this summer, it seemed like there was finally a critical mass of listening going on. I wrestled with how, what, and even if I should write anything about what was going on across American cities. Um, one of the things I began to think about in regards to allyship is the difference between being silent um, and, and seating room so that others can speak. I thought carefully about my own subjectivity as a middle-class, straight, cis, Jewish, white woman and wondered if it, was my if, it was, if it was my place at all to speak out at that moment. More importantly, I really didn't want a virtue signal by appropriating someone else's voice, story, or narrative. And my current stance is that the work of anti-racism really needs to be sustainable. It's a long-term practice that needs to be integrated into all of my critical writing and curating, and in lectures like this tonight. Um, it's not siloed to a single essay. Equally pressing is the need to open up platforms to make room for critics of a diversity of backgrounds and identity expressions. Writer and trans activist Charlie Jane Anders has this to say about allyship. We talk a lot about allyship, but it's not just posting memes on Twitter. It's noticing who's left out and finding ways to bring them inside. So what are the ways that are going on to bring people inside? And which I'm hopeful about is this London-based initiative called New Architecture Writers which is a free training program geared to black and minority uh, ethnic emerging writers and other uh, underrepresented groups in design journalism and curatorial practice. The program tackles skill building with workshops and one-on-one -on -one mentoring, but it also understands that networking and building connections within journalism is just as important of structure, as structuring a sentence. These, we can all agree that so much of getting one's foot in the door comes from these informal connections rather than a cold pitch via email. And yet, even though I'm really excited about new architecture writers, and um, personally, I try to meet and encourage emerging writers, I'm also conflicted. Um, I wonder, is it ethical to train writers to enter a field in which a career is not only competitive, but also precarious, even for us established critics. I've written through a number of expansions and contractions within design publishing. So the closing or tightening of belts of certain publications 
doesn't seem to throw me. It doesn't seem like that that is the death knell for criticism. In fact, during the last recession, um, in around 2008, 2009, we saw a boom of new writers uh, start blogs that would later turn into larger careers. As an independent critic, though, uh, I'm concerned that the per article rates for freelance assignments have not budged in decades. In fact, they've gotten worse. Uh, the dollar a word, um, which is standard, uh, is really something that some of the places that I write to, even the more um, prestigious places can't, can't really afford. So I wonder, you know, is it sustainable uh, to ask, or even perhaps ethical, to ask uh, emerging and established writers to patch together a living on $200 assignments? And how is this necessary hustle, right? Like you really got to hustle for each of those, um, an even heavier burden for practitioners for, uh, from underrepresented groups. Now, I don't have a million dollar plan to rescue publishing and criticism. Uh, maybe we can take that on uh, in the Q&A. Um, but I, I would like to say that what I'd like to see uh, as I close is a deepening of critical thought, a slowing down uh, of the churn in order to focus on larger cultural ideas and a diversity of voices represented in the stories and in the bylines. Ultimately, the practice of criticism is as much about labor as it is about love and shouldn't be considered a hobby or a labor of love, a side hustle. Criticism must be nurtured and protected not only with training, but with networks, platforms, and funding that allow the stories that we tell ourselves in order to live, to find voice, and to thrive. And I'll close with this last image is from Lauren Halsey, uh, an artist who wants to be an architect um, who is working out of Crenshaw. This is her exhibition at the David Cordancy Gallery. And um, she basically uses the profits from her art making to uh, put back into the nonprofit that she founded, a community center called Summit everything uh, based in uh, uh, based in Crenshaw uh, in which she is actually operating a mutual aid uh, food bank out of right now. So uh, I read about Lauren and her project uh, for pinup earlier this year. And uh, so it's, I think her work is both super optimistic, but also sort of presents uh, a kind of ecology uh, for working. So uh, I don't know if it's our ecology, but I, I think it's a really interesting model. So I will stop the screen share. So thank you. Um, there we go. I think we're back. Great. Thank you. That's, that's tremendous. You've given a lot to think about. Um, I want to remind everybody to, uh, to uh, ask your questions through the Q&A link. We'll get to those uh, as they come in as much as we can with the time we have. Um, but I wanted to kind of start off and kind of track back to one of the things that you first mentioned about utopia. Um, what does a utopia look like in your mind for architecture criticism? And given the realities of the world, how do we get as close to possible? Uh, how do we get as close to that <clears throat> utopia as possible? How does that work? How, how much of that is the social justice, the, the ally, the advocate that you spoke to? I don't know. I just... Uh, it's, it's interesting. I, I mean, I, first I would say that, you know, we have to be careful when we talk about utopias, right? Because, you, you know, if we look at Moore's utopia, utopia in itself is a critique. Um, and, and that it is a, a sort of, so, so, you know, what do I hope for, for criticism? Um, I hope for a lot of voices. Um, you know, I think that's something when I was in grad school, I started a zine called Loud Paper, which was about architecture and pop culture. And I did so um, because I didn't see enough platforms uh, for people like myself, like a grad student, to write about architecture. And while we have sort of more platforms, we have, you know, one could start a blog, one can, you know, post on Medium, um, I still sort of hope for more, right? I, I, like, it's almost, you know, and, and it's, it's a catch-22, right? It's because I'm asking, in a way, for people to labor for something that there is unpaid. 
and I, I don't really want to do that. So I want to figure out ways that we can get people into the practice so that there are more voices that we, there is a kind of collective criticism where we're in dialogue with each other as critics, um, but that, uh, that people aren't, um, uh, that people, the people whose voices have been historically marginalized um, are able to participate. Um, and I think that really comes from finding ways uh, of support. Mimi, I also wanted to uh, echo Dan's thanks. I mean, this is a really tremendous talk. And I have a number of questions, but I do want to <laughs> limit myself to one so that the audience can ask questions. Um, it also doesn't help that I think you answered already a lot of the questions that I had beforehand. But one that I was curious about too is that you've written pretty extensively about other disciplines and about how they intersect with architecture, especially landscape, architecture, urban design. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how criticism and curation in those fields informs your work. Mm. I think there's been, like, especially in relationship to landscape, um, uh, and, and also within relationship to art, but I think within landscape, like ideas of thinking about work um, through the lens of ecology um, and sort of, you know, sort of larger systems thinking, uh, that's something that actually is uh, really embedded in the curatorial work that I'm doing with Iker Gill for Exhibit Columbus, when we are sort of thinking about um, the whole Mississippi watershed um, as a kind of site a territory from which we want to sort of draw participants and sort of think about how that connects to the center of the United States. So, you know, how, how, we, how landscape sort of connects to questions of ecology, how that then gets brought back into architecture, um, how art takes on issues of social justice, um, which uh, is often, and, and even participatory practice, which is often very difficult to take on within architecture, I think those things have, you know, really kind of been batting around um, in my mind for quite, uh, quite a long time. Very cool. I, um, I also, you know, I also kind of wanted to ask about your choice of subjects too, you know, because like, based on your status as a, an independent critic, one without institutional support or the, the employment security that comes with it does match the precarity that, that often characterizes modern academia and profession of architecture. Uh, can you talk about how your how that affects your choice of subjects and the critical frame that you bring to bring to them? Well, I think for me, um, I, I really go for subjects that I'm interested in, right? Like if we are if I'm going to be writing, <laughs> um, I, I want to like I want to pitch uh, stuff that I want to write. Um, when I was uh, an emerging writer, uh, I wrote a lot. I was writing, you know, you know, you know, dozens of articles a year, uh, you know, sort of keeping the churn going. And it wasn't always work that I wanted to write about. Um, and now that I sort of balance my practice with um, with teaching and curatorial, um, I have a little bit more opportunity to sort of, if not pick and choose, right? Because ultimately, it's an editor who uh, picks and chooses. But I, but I do try to pitch stories. Um, where it's something that I am interested in, and I want to get, um, I want to get more knowledge out of. I, I mean, I really love the act of interviewing. Um, you know, I could I could interview people like for weeks, and I'd like never have to write the story, right? Um, but really, kind of getting the ear of someone who is an expert or invested in their own practice, um, and and so I think that's what's at this point in time, um, that's what's driving me is sort of um, who is doing um, interesting work. Um, the Yor Nongo, who I interviewed for Pinup and whose work on the Lavu uh, I showed, uh, the Sami architect, um, he, I wanted to interview him um, and because I was just, I had seen a piece of his at the uh, Chicago Architecture Biennial and it was so weird. Uh, it was made out of video monitors, fish, uh, translucent fish guts that had been dried and stretched uh, and logs, and and this was being shown in architecture biennial, and I like as with the work um, that I showed from the Venice Architecture Biennale for the US Pavilion, like I'm interested in like well what are going to be the next languages, right? Like how you know, like what's an architecture of like 
fish skin. Like, uh, the, and, in, and I think when we think of it within systems, right, and call, you know, sort of the nature of a changing uh, climate, like that's not such an impossible thing to think about um, that, may, that maybe we need to look at other sort of materials um, a, as a way of sort of predicting a, a future, maybe even a utopia um, that, that, that might happen. Cool. Well, Garnett Cat uh, Cadigan um, sent in a question. He shows up uh, in a uh, in a cameo form in your talk uh, on one of your slides, and he first thanks you for your wonderful talk, and he says he'd like to hear more uh, of your reflections on the virtues of writing about architecture from the perspective of an amateur. Or having touched on some of that already, perhaps say more about the virtues of an amateur's eye. Oh, that's a great question, and. Oh, it's so nice to hear from Garnett. Um, we, we were on a panel together um, about Speedboat in New York a few years ago, and it was like such a great um, opportunity to speak with him. Um, you know, when I did a zine uh, uh, as a graduate student, I didn't know how to write, um, and I didn't check myself, and um, I just like kind of spilled it out, and, and part of me really misses the energy that came with being a um, an amateur writer. Um, like I knew, you know, I was like a smart ass grad student, but um, I was certainly sort of just finding my voice as a um, as a writer. Um, and one of the things I like to give uh, students when I teach workshops on criticism is uh, um, George Perec's The Species of Spaces, and we look we read very carefully through. Um, the way that he observes the city and the street. Um, and then I use that as kind of a text to get these, you know, emerging writers who really have not done much professional writing to just kind of get their voice out, right? Like to really sort of allow um, a, a just expression to happen, to get to a kind of, observe, like a real deep observation of the city around them. And yeah, I think if anything, I could go back and claim, you know, now that I'm professional, um, I, but that I missed is is not checking myself is really kind of allowing um, the critique to f kind of flow um, and be you know funny and um, pointed you know and, and all those kind of fun things that you can do when you have a zine um, that that is you know read by a small number of people. All right, great. Um, this is from another question from our audience. This is. Uh, Biana uh, Bogosian, um, and uh, she thanks you very much for the lecture. And uh, her question is, how do you think immersive and participatory media, including AR and VR and gaming platforms, which are becoming popular in architectural design, especially post-COVID, can reshape teaching or practicing for this? Okay. I, I feel like this is a ringer. Hi, Biana. Uh, it's, I, my last piece that I published in Metropolis um, was actually about uh, gaming and design um, in VR and AR space um, and how the subjectivity afforded by game culture um, and these kind of mixed reality, uh, I'm like, not sure I'm gonna even be able to explain it, right? Like that you have the goggles and part of your body is in a kind of virtual space and part of your body is in real space and the various artists who are working with this, there's a real freedom uh, there and because it's embodied, right? Um, there's also ways of expression that can happen. And so I was talking to Leah Wolfman, uh, who is, teaches at SIRC, is also a former student of mine and, and a really kind of interesting emerging designer with working in mixed reality. And she talks about it as this idea of not gaming, G-A-M-I-N-G, but gaming, G-A-Y-I-N-G, right? That, that because you're inserting so much subjectivity uh, into it, like questions of non-binary are really kind of critical, right? Like you don't have to say um, this is ground and this is virtual, like it's both and all the time. And I think that that's really an exciting uh, place for architecture um, because it's offering some you know, freedoms um, that, uh, and, and I guess that maybe a turn a turn away from the kind of baggage of modernism that we still carry uh, in uh, pedagogically in institutions. Um, and so this is just like a kind of a wild west that I'm excited by. 
I have a question about the next generation of critics too, because you were talking about that at the end of your talk uh, about the ethics of, you know, of even teaching or nourish, uh, nurturing another generation when there may not even be positions for them. Yet, at the same time, you also uh, did a really fascinating uh, series of workshops in Hong Kong um, about developing um, that next generation of architecture critics uh, in the Pearl River Delta. And I was wondering how your experience there affects your outlook on the future of criticism. I mean, I think different play places are in different um, relationships to, you know, in terms of or in different places, stages in relationship to criticism. Um, Hong Kong and that region um, does not have a huge robust uh, criticism culture like we have um, in Europe and the United States. Um, robust, I, I suppose that we could argue about robust, but uh, but it but it really doesn't have um, a tradition of, pra of that kind of practicing of um, criticism. And so one of the things that we did was we partnered with um, a online uh, magazine so that we could actually place some of the articles that we were developing um, in publication. Um, so I think, you know, part of, part of building, building out sort of these, uh, these ideas of new critics or sort of uh, new next generation is also finding ways to get their work into the world um, uh, and, and so that they can build up a collection of clips uh, that can take them into their next, um, you know, into their next assignment. All right. Well, you know, as, um, as we're getting close to the end here, we thought that we might ask you if you wanted to, uh, you know, give a few thoughts about or let us know what your, your next projects are and what, what you're working on. Sure. Um, I'm working simultaneously on a brand new piece that just got assigned yesterday for the LA Times um, on an exhibition of uh, toilet paper holders um, that by, by a, a real diverse group of designers. Um, but the, the project actually comes with a kind of critique of the toilet paper industry um, and how its impact on the uh, environment is really huge. Um, so, uh, so that's a piece I'm working on. Um, and then longer term, um, I'm working on Exhibit Columbus, uh, which uh, we're in the middle of a symposium. So if you want to turn in, tune in to uh, hear some talks, more talks, um, you can find all of the talks listed on the Exhibit Columbus website. Um, and then 2021, um, we'll be creating a series of in public installations uh, by architects and artists um, in and around Columbus, Indiana, which is a sort of like mecca of modernist design. And we're looking at uh, what is the future of the middle city. So it's kind of a kind of riff on the idea of speculation that I was talking about earlier. So hope, hoping that we will get some really kind of unusual, um, as, you know, as you can tell, I like things that are a little bit on the weird side. So I'm hoping for some weirdness um, in the middle all of all of this like really beautiful modernist architecture. Well, good. Well, actually, we did have one uh, one question that just came in a second ago. So I'll ask it. This is from Jose Alonso, um, who wanted to know if you have any advice on how to approach architecture critique for someone who's more of a creator, uh, creative writer. That is somebody who is more experienced with narrative uh, type writings rose to, uh, you know, training and in, in, in practice and criticism. Uh, it's interesting thought because I, I often look to narrative um, as inspiration for um, for criticism. Um, but I, I, I am kind of a structuralist when it comes to my writing. Um, and I really outline arguments. So um, if, if you really want to sort of, I love all of the observation and sort of the description that comes with uh, narrative writing, but if that is, doesn't have an argument, it never coalesces into critique. Um, so I, I like to sort of, I also work with, in, when I workshop with students, um, really kind of stress, like, we need an outline. And I don't, I don't, I give them like a whole range of variations on the outline from, you know, the hero's journey to the like, you know, sort of the, what is it, the hamburger, you know, like in all of these kind of dumb ideas for outlines. And I don't care, I say, I don't care what kind of outline you have, but I need a structure. Um, and so design, design, and oftentimes the people I'm working with are designers. So I'm like, design the structure 
for your essay, um, and then we will fill fill it in uh, with this other stuff. Well, well, thank you so much, Mimi Zeiger, uh, for being our guest tonight. Um, this has been a real singular pleasure. Um, and to everyone else out there who's been watching, uh, please join us next Wednesday when we welcome the Pulitzer winning critic of the Philadelphia Inquirer, Inga Saffron, to Wither Criticism. Until then, good night. Thank you.